Anine, I'm Lisa Meaches. Welcome to our show. Over the years of producing The Sharing Circle, we've explored the history of how Indigenous people have been treated in Canada and how this affects them today. In fact, we've discovered so many unusual circumstances concerning Aboriginal life, we wanted to share many of these little-known facts in one episode we're calling Did You Know? And as you'll see in this documentary, when it comes to the state of Aboriginal affairs in this country, many Canadians are still in the dark. Do you know when Aboriginal people got the vote in Canada? Uh, no, I don't. No, I have no clue. 1940. 1940. Well, close, 1960. That's not close. It doesn't happen until 1960. My name is Brian Rice, and I teach at University of Winnipeg. Before 1960, an Aboriginal person could vote, but only if they gave up their status as a registered Indian. Under Diefenbaker's government, it's finally decided for the first time that Aboriginal people can remain or Indians can remain as Indians and at the same time get the federal vote. Uh, 1968 in some provinces, I believe. But did you know Aboriginal people actually won the right to vote 75 years earlier? In 1885, uh, Aboriginal people in the East were given the franchise, the right to vote. But it was, was repealed because of the outcry by the general population who, who said, why should we have to support these people, uh, so on and so forth, and at the same time allow them to have the rights of citizens. Can you tell me what the Indian Act is? Uh, no, I can't. No. Do you know what the Indian Act is? Yeah, it's a policy that um, basically sets out rules and regulations that uh, status Indians have to follow. Oh, the Indian Act was never translated in, in uh, an official, in any native tongue at all. And here it was representing, you know, who Indian people were, what they're allowed to do, you know, really has all this control on Indian lives. It's to eliminate, eventually to eliminate uh, any distinctions between Aboriginal people and the dominant society. This is uh, page one and, um, of, of the 56 pages. They're beaded over. Um, the Indian Act is beaded over with white beads and red beads were the white pages. That was to render something um, that had so much power into something like that was like just pretty to look at, <laughs> you know? Even today, there's an Indian Act, you know? It's, it's a colonial act that only applies to, uh, to Indians. The Indian Act became law in 1876. Over the years, it was amended to increase restrictions on Aboriginal people. Has it ever been illegal for uh, uh, status Indians to operate mechanized farming equipment? I would say false. Let's say that again. Has it ever been illegal for status Indians to operate mechanized farm equipment? Probably, yes. Probably. It has to be false. <laughs> it's actually true. Wow. <laughs> and that means that Aboriginal people on their farms can only work with hand implements that they make themselves and not even allowed to use metal for nails. And as we get into the 1880s, Aboriginal people are getting very good at uh, farming and there's a great outcry by the uh, population that this is unfair competition so therefore Aboriginal people should not be allowed to sell their grain. There was a program loaning cows to Aboriginal people so that they could learn husbandry you know and taking care of domestic animals and these types of things. You, here you've got uh, cattle and you can't eat it because you're not allowed to kill the cattle for food. So people were starting to starve. There was a, um, an Aboriginal man uh, whose name was Almighty Voice who killed a, 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 a cow in, around 1890 or so. He was taken by the RCMP or Northwest Mounted Police, I guess, at that time and ended up uh, being told that he was going to be hung for it. He ended up killing the Mountie and um, was on the run for about two years. And then finally they caught him 
a posse of about 200 with cannons. And we just wanted to feed his people because they were starving. And... Has it ever been illegal for status Indians to uh, practice their traditional ceremonies? False. False? That's actually true. Wow. Yeah. False. That's actually true. Oh, really? Yeah. Potlatches are a celebration of culture, tradition, and history. Children are involved right from the start. Even though they might, may not fully understand the specifics about potlatch, they're here to gain the, the spirit. And in that spirit, they gain the strength of identifying who they are. The European Christians actually believe that the traditional ceremonies and sweat lodge and whatnot were the work of the devil. My name is Mark Francis Rummel. I teach at the University of Winnipeg Religious Studies Department. You know, the traditional ceremonies, Sundance, Sweat Lodge, Vision Quest, Shake Tent, the, the feasting, the giveaway, the potlatches, all the traditional ceremonies were actually outlawed in Canada. It was against the law. It was against the law to be singing, to be drumming, to be dancing, to have a giveaway. It's totally bizarre. The um, laws pertaining to uh, the prohibition against the potlatch actually starts about 1884. In the potlatch, all sorts of you know, goods are given away, where an ind individual would almost sort of give away their whole wealth. It's so central to the uh, you know, existence of the whole culture, essentially. By about 1894 or so, then you have prohibitions against uh, traditional dancing and sun dancing and all these types of things. And the idea, of course, is that as long as, um, as, long as Aboriginal people are tied to these things, they will never be able to integrate. They'll never be part of the civilized process. Like, people were charged for this. That's totally bizarre. When you, how can you charge somebody for singing, for dancing? You know, like, it's really weird, but it's all part of the colonial enterprise. You say you have to, you know, if you're trying to take over, uh, you know, the land and the resources, you have to, you know, eradicate the, uh, the traditional ways. It was the Indian agent living on each reserve who enforced the rules. Aboriginal people even needed a pass signed by the agent before they could leave their community. Do you know what an Indian agent is? I have no clue what that is. He was the one that lived, made sure that the Indian Act was enforced. So they are becoming the law unto themselves, eh? little almost dictatorships. Has it ever been illegal for status Indians to possess alcohol? Uh, false. You know, caring, selling, any, any offenses concerning liquor, you, know, you weren't supposed to be around liquor at all. Eh? But yeah, you could get, you know, six months imprisonment, you know, for, for liquor offenses. And it could be, you know, harsh, hard labor. Has it ever been illegal for a registered status Indian to be in a pool hall in Canada? Uh, false. That's actually true. That's true. Yeah. You know, even being in a pool hall where there's no liquor, you know, that could be a six-month offense, eh? First Nations veterans are proud of their wartime contributions. But when they returned to Canada, they were faced with mixed emotions. Even vets, you know, coming back from, from the war can't go out to the Legion Halls. First Nations veterans were supposed to receive the same benefits as any other servicemen or women. The problems occurred when First Nations veterans were told to return to their reserves and see their Indian agents about their benefits. Veterans Affairs spread news about the Charter through posters in Legion Halls. But the Liquor Prohibitions Act prevented First Nations veterans from entering Legions. So they had no way to find out what their rights were. Did Aboriginal veterans get the same benefits as other veterans after World War II? Uh, no, actually, um, I don't think so because uh, my relative was a Sergeant Tommy Prince and he, was, um, he wasn't recognized when he got back from... Uh, from the war and that, and uh, yeah, it was uh, not not good, you know, he just went on the streets and uh, he didn't get the same treatment. Next on the sharing circle, a few other things you might not know. Even among bands and band counselors and chiefs, uh, if they want to set up a business, uh, they have to apply and get permission from the federal government. At most traditional ceremonies, one can see the key ingredient of Aboriginal society equality between men and women. Uh, when you live a subsistence lifestyle, you need cooperation, equal cooperation between men and women.
What some people don't realize is that in some societies, women played some pretty prominent roles in terms of even military roles and such uh, in defending the communities. Women had a great say in terms of who would be the representatives of the people. In the old days, in a traditional way, is that the women were the ones that were basically the bosses, <laughs> the decision makers and the, you know, the, the leaders. Male Europeans did not want to deal with the, uh, the women. The women appointed the men that, the, that would deal with the Europeans. So they still were you know, basically behind the scenes controlling things, I guess, if you want to put it that way. And the women, we are the life givers. We are the water carriers. We're the backbone of the family. And the men are the providers, the protectors, and the fire keepers. Because you see out there, there's that balance, that male and that female. I've discovered in looking at the early treaties, the first agreements, women are signatories to any, any agreements concerning land in about the 17th century. And by about the 18th century, they're omitted from, they begin to be omitted from the process. So you don't see their names any longer. From the teachings that people today, the elders and traditional teachers talk about, is the role of women is that they're the ones that are the bringers of life. Without them, we don't have life. And without traditional Aboriginal society, American democracy may not have developed as it did. Well, Aboriginal societies played a great role in terms of influencing European societies and changing their governing structures. The Iroquois Confederacy, for instance, uh, were very influential and were called in 1753 to the Albany Conference so that Benjamin Franklin could understand the process of governance that the Six Nations had. In uh, 1988, uh, the U.S. Congress passed a resolution basically uh, stating that the Iroquois Confederacy was very influential in them creating a democratic charter and a constitution. While Aboriginal governments helped shape American democracy, in Canada, those traditional governing structures were outlawed. There was also a change that would start to occur about 1869 uh, in terms of uh, absolving the traditional forms of government in favor of the elector electoral type of uh, band council system that we know today exists. And by 1924, the RCMP goes into Six Nations and then deposes the last uh, traditional government governance. Can you name one thing that could help the Aboriginal people right now? Um, reduced corruption uh, amongst reserve leaders and a better internal government. It's only really with the revised Indian Act in 1951 and with the franchise being given to, uh, to Indians in 1960 that businesses really start to, uh, you know, Aboriginal people start getting into businesses and such. Ainsley is a perfect example of the fastest growing trend in Aboriginal business in Canada. She's young, she's Métis and female. We have found that there are literally hundreds of Aboriginal community members that want to start their own business. While it's challenging for Aboriginal entrepreneurs in cities, starting a business on a reserve can prove even more difficult. If they want to set up a business, uh, they have to apply and get permission from the federal government. And it takes uh, sometimes 60 days, it could take six months, it could take even more than a year or so even to get an answer. If it's an affirmative, then uh, you've got a whole nother wait of a year or two and then you've got to try and get the, the, mo the money. Do you think Aboriginal people have the same opportunities as other Canadians? No, 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 no. Because you ask me those questions and it's illegal for them to do some, you know, just everyday ordinary things and that just seems uh, way out of proportion. Next on the sharing circle, a few more things you might want to know. There's already a presumption being made, even at an early stage, that uh, Aboriginal people will never be true owners of their lands. Morning. 